great. Okay, so um, today I'm gonna start our uh, regularly scheduled uh, meeting of the Town of Nantucket Zoning Board of Appeals, Thursday, August 13th, it's 1.08 p.m. Um, I am going to read the, um, the script for the remotely conducted open meetings first. So as a preliminary matter, this is Susan McCarthy, Chief of the Nantucket Zoning Board of Appeals. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. So you'll need to unmute yourself and then mute yourself again. So Michael O'Mara. Hello. Karim Kosayatak. Here. Jeff Thayer. Hi. Mark Poor. Here. Jim Mondani. Here. Um, and Ed Tool's not attending. Lisa Botticelli is not attending. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Eleanor Antonietti. Present. Okay. Anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative when I call your name. And everyone, please note that some of the people I call off may not be logged in at the time I'm calling them right now. They may log in later on in the meeting. Um, and there may be others who log on who are not on this list. Ryan Swain for Abram Quarry, 6 Kinnick Lane. Okay. Justin Brooks, owner applicant, 6 Kinnick Lane. No, I'm saying that wrong. Justin, can you? I know you're here. Let me unmute you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dan Boy, surveyor for application number 13-20. Here. Uh, Ethan McMorrow, architect for application 13-20. I might have to unmute Ethan. Here. Okay. Here. Yep, Here. thank you, Ethan. Um, Kevin Dale, attorney for application number 15-20. Here. Whit Gifford, attorney for application number 16-20. Present. John Brusher, attorney for application 17-20. Here. Michael Day, contractor for application number 17-20. Uh, Bill Quirk, owner slash applicant for application number 17-20. And Jane Quirk, owner applicant for application 17-20. Okay. Okay, so this open meeting of the Nantucket Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to permit to, sorry, participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded to, so that public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. And this meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Nantucket Zoning Board of Appeals is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast will be captured by the recording. Please be sure to properly leave the meeting when your matter has been discussed or upon final adjournment. Um, if you don't know how to do that, there's on the bottom, there's a red button that says leave meeting. Make sure you click that to actually exit. Uh, all supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. 
the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I, the chair, note otherwise. So for some ground rules, um, we're now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I, the chair, will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until I yield the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in a conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Um, when we get to public comment, after the members of the board have spoken, I will forward public comment as follows. Um, staff will activate the chat feature on YouTube and members of the public who have comments or questions can use this feature to communicate with the public body. Instructions are on the town's website. Um, and the chair, so myself and the staff, we will do our best to address the questions and comments that come up. And then for this meeting, each vote will be taken by roll call. So those are our instructions for today. And we can get going with um, the approval of the agenda. If someone would like to make that motion, it's, it's the amended agenda. I will make that motion, Madam Chair, Michael Romero. Okay, would anyone like to second that? Second. Okay, so motion has been made and seconded. So I will do roll call for all those in favor. I'm just gonna go down the list. So uh, Michael O'Mara? Aye. Karim Koseyatak? Aye. Jeff Thayer? Aye. Mark Poor? Aye. And Jim Mondani? Aye. Okay. So moving on. Um, so the approval of the minutes for July 9th, I read them over. I didn't see any issue. I did not sit on other business during that meeting. So I, there may have been some um, revisions there. Did anyone on the board have any revisions or comments on that? No. Would someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes as drafted for the July 9th, 2020 meeting? I will make that motion. Okay. Would anyone care to second? I'll second. Okay. So again, I'm just going to go down the list for that approval. Uh, Michael O'Mara? Aye. Karim Koseyatak? Aye. Jeff Thayer? Aye. Mark Poor? Aye. And Jim Mondani? Aye. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move on to our first matter, which is um, old business 066-00. This is Sarah Ann Brooks and Justin Robert Brooks. And I'm sorry, I'm, am I pronouncing it wrong, but it's six Kinney. Kin Nick Way and Brian Swain is presenting. Hi, Susan. Hi. Uh, it's Kin Nick and Nick Way, but it's Nick. tough okay. to pronounce. Okay. Uh, for the record, uh, Brian Swain, attorney for Justin and Sarah Brooks, they're the owners of Six Kin Nick and Nick Way. And this application before you is a request for a determination that. Uh, Justin and Sarah's proposed driveway modification and relocation is an insubstantial modification to the Abram Quarry's 40B comprehensive permit and its plans. Uh, specifically, what the Brooks are requesting to do is to move their side-by-side two-car parking spaces, which are located at the end of Kinnikinnick Way, and relocate them so that they have access to their property off Field Avenue. 
And a little background on Knick Way is that it's not a traditionally laid out roadway. Rather, it's a uh, 16 foot wide access easement that runs across all six parcels located on Knick Way uh, from Folger Avenue towards Field Avenue. And uh, the, the traveled portion of Knick Way, it's very narrow. Um, like other densely zoned neighborhoods, when parking is at a premium, uh, the residents and their overnight guests and their kids or, or anyone coming to visit them park in the roadway. And that's exactly the case. What's happening here on Kinnikinick is that uh, Justin and Sarah are located at the end of Kinnikinick and uh, residents or their guests or their kids or whomever is visiting people in the Abrams Quarry 40B development, they park on Kinnikinick Way and this has caused uh, Justin and Sarah to be parked in and blocked in. Um, they've had to sit in their home for hours to try and find whoever is parking in front of them. They've had to call tow truck drivers and they've had to go uh, around the neighborhood and knock on different doors to figure out who, who's blocking them in. So this proposed relocation from Knick Way to the other boundary line of their property on Field Avenue, uh, it would allow them to freely come and go from their property. Um, it would also reduce the traffic on Knick Way by one six. And it, they need to be able to come and go. Uh, they have children and, you know, as, as for a matter of safety and also for a matter of convenience. And there's also adequate room for them to relocate it on their property on Kinnick Way, or excuse me, Field Avenue. And what, what the board's role in this application is to make a determination pursuant to 760 CMR 5605 11A and B, which I've cited in my application, that this proposed alteration and relocation of their, their driveway and parking spaces are deemed an insubstantial modification to the comprehensive permit. So the aforementioned CMR provides a couple examples um, as what they determine are substantial changes and insubstantial changes. And I've cited that in the application. Uh, in summary, a, a substantial change is a change that is greater than 10% to the 40B development as a whole, or changing the building types or uh, the building tenure, um, increasing the bedroom counts by more than 10%. That's what the CMR defines as a substantial change. Insubstantial changes are generally defined in that CMR as administerial changes and modifications uh, that are less than 10% to the 40B program, um, lowering the number of bedroom counts less than 10%, changing the building mat materials, uh, changing the financing program, stuff like that. And, you know, what the applicants are seeking to do here is to do a like kind change where they're relocating what they existingly have for a driveway from one portion of their property to another. And it's very consistent with what the insubstantial changes are uh, delineated in 760 CMR 56 11 A and B. Uh, and this board has also determined on four separate applications in 2007 that requests to modify driveway are insubstantial modifications to the comprehensive permit. And those four applications, I think Eleanor may have provided in the staff report, but those were all approved 5-0. So what we're requesting is that the board determine that the proposed driveway relocation of parking spaces from uh, Kinnick Way to Field Avenue is an insubstantial modification of the permit and uh, we, we'd like permission to do so. I'd be happy to answer any questions or address any of the issues that Eleanor raised in her staff report. Um, I guess we could start with some questions if you want. Um, so I just had, I had a couple of questions um, just for clarification. The existing driveway now, the, the um, the brick share with their neighbor, right? Once they're only getting rid of the one spot, the second spot is going to stay. Justin, are those two spots yours? Uh, 
I'm looking at um, uh, if I look on page 15 of the packet, it's from the GIS map. And Madam Chair, I just want to interject quickly while you're looking that up. On page yeah. 25 of the packet, as submitted by Attorney Swain, yeah. of the four requested modifications, one was actually denied. It's uh, worded in that way, duly seconded, voted zero to five to approve. So one of them was actually denied, but I think the way the minutes read, it may have been because the applicant didn't show up. I'm not really sure, <laughs> but uh, just to cl clarify. Okay. There, there were four requests, one was denied. I'm a little confused. On page 15, on the aerial photo, it shows the driveways off of Kinnick, Kinnick Way. And then when you go to page 28 of the packet, somebody marked up showing two existing parking spaces off of Field Avenue, deleting one of those and then shifting them over onto the lot. What's now? I just need to get up on the same staff report you have. That's not in the staff report, that's in the packet. Okay. Is that the proposed driveway? You know what, you know what Jeff, that, Jeff, that's the wrong, that's the wrong um, property. That, that one that says that it says move over to this side, two spaces too deep and reseed and add privet to the old space. I think that's referring to one that may have already been done because it's not, it's not the right lot. They're, they're down, right. they're down one to the left. Okay. That so might've just been a markup for some other, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. Um, I think it's just showing, I think it's just shot, but so, so whatever. My, my, I guess my two things were one, just confirming that where they put the, where they're, Brian, where they're putting the proposed new driveway, it's not directly across from the abutter. No. Nope. And, um, and then our, as in our staff report points out, you, there is for the board to know, there is the ability they, they, the owners should be able to obtain a waiver for section eight in their permit from the trustees of the HOA to resolve the declaration of project protective covenants, the 12 foot width restriction. Um, but, but to also note that that talks about the width of common driveways. So it seems to it seems to me, and I'm just one person, and everyone else may you know have the comments that you want and press the questions that you have that you have as well. But um, I th I think this is an insubstantial change, and I think that the comp permit provides for a way for the HOA um, to deal with this and to to be able to waive and, and move this. That, provi that provision, Susan, is actually in the Declaration of Protective Covenants that, okay. yeah, I, I probably muddied the waters by putting screenshots in. I just didn't want you to have to go find it in the documents, but because they're so fat. Either, okay, so so if we deem it's insubstantial, then they have the way, they have the, through the through their HOA and their trustees to go through. Right, the, so that's, that's what they need from us, the, the insubstantial versus substantial, and then as, as to his ability to get the waiver for the 12 foot width. So yeah. Brian and I had a discussion about the 12 foot width as far as the comp permit goes, applying simply to the shared driveways. But then unfortunately in the Declaration of Protective Covenants, it says driveways. Right. Yeah. So one wonders if that's just a typo or a lack of clarity or whatever, but it's there. Um, but so I just, still, even though it's there, there is a mechanism for them to get relief. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Based on everything that you know, staff provided, um, the applicant provided, um, and, and reading the pertinent parts, I, I, in my opinion, this is insubstantial. But does anyone else on the board have any comments or questions they'd like to ask the applicant? 
And I'm just, pardon me one second, I'm just gonna close this door. Um, I, Brian, I just have a question. I, I'm okay with it. I, I think it's in substantial, but when you read that, the declaration, um, it almost seems like the HOA has the power to grant all this. And I, I never know, you know, do we still need to make this determination when it, it gives the HOA the power in the comprehensive permit? Yes, in, you do because it's a site plan issue. But so is it, uh, I, I, does the remember the, the, the site plan review is driveways and configurations and parking it's dealing with all the infrastructure or safety issues so when mm. they approve the driveways in this in the formation and configuration that you see on the record plan that's the site plan review that approved that so it's just unfortunately it's a two-step process i see what you're saying because it does yeah. seem minor but t just to cover our bases and to be clear and this is how it was done in 2007 uh, we just want to make sure that this is done properly because other people, I'm already hearing from other people in that development who want to do something similar. So, okay. I I'm actually hoping that the HOA documents would, would trump any, anything we would do, but I guess not. Yep. So Eleanor was spot on the uh, there's, there's two different governing documents. One's the comprehensive permit that's solely uh, modified by the ZBA, and then there's the the restrictions that are modified by the HOA. So, the the belt and suspenders is to get your approval first, and then seek the waiver if necessary from the HOA thereafter. Yeah. Okay. I, I I'm I'm okay with that. I'm just wondering if we need to be part of the process when the HOA documents or the declarations state things like that that they have the power. But I understand. Yeah, so we're only part of step one, which is just determining substantial and insubstantial. And then they'll deal with the HOA. So any other board member have a comment on this one or um, can I move on to see if there's anyone in the, any, ch any public comment on this? And I don't believe there's no, was there mail on this one? Did this one have the? No mail, and there's nothing on the chat okay. panel. Okay, so if no one has any other comments, would anyone like to make a motion on this one? Or is it a motion, or do we just make a determination? You Sorry. can make a motion. It's one and the same. You, you make okay. a motion to determine it as insubstantial. Okay. I'll make that motion uh, to make the determination that it's insubstantial to uh, as shown on the on the application. The application and and sorry and to authorize Susan to sign as we did last month. You may remember with something else in another forty B and to authorize okay. the chair to sign a letter memorializing this decision. So moved. Okay. Does someone care to second? Second, Michael Lumera. Okay, so I will go down the list again. Um, all those, in, I'll vote on this one. So I will vote aye. Um, Michael O'Meara? Aye. Karen Kosayatak? Aye. Jeff Thayer? Aye. And Jim Mondani? Aye. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so next we move on to. So this next one is requested to continue to September 10th. Um, would, this is uh, application 9-20. Um, Timothy E. Quinslick and Elizabeth A. Quinslick, 88 Quidnet Road, Sarah Alger representing. Would someone like to make the motion to, um, to continue this to the next regularly scheduled meeting, September 10th? If you would like to know why this is continued again, uh, the attorneys told me that it's still with the HDC. Okay. Yeah, someone want to make a motion to continue? I'll make that motion, Michael O'Meara. Someone to second? Second. 
Okay, so Michael made the motion, Jeff seconded. I will go back through the list. So myself, I, Michael O'Mara. I. Karim Kosetak. I. Jeff Thayer. I. And Mark Poor. I. Okay. Um, the next application uh, is eleven twenty. Peter J. McKay and Allison McKay and David P. McKay and Ann M. Fanoff, trustee of the McKay Fanoff Family Trust. This is twenty one and twenty five Monahans at Road. Sarah Alger representing that one as well. Um, they have also requested to continue to the regularly scheduled ZBA meeting on September tenth, two thousand twenty. Um, would Michael, do you want to make a motion to continue that one as well? Please, Madam Chair. Okay, and Jeff, would you like to second again? Sure, yes. Okay, so um, I'll just roll call again. Myself, I, Michael O'Mara. I. Karen Kosayatak. I. Jeff Thayer. I. Mark Poor. I. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so our next application is 13-20, Rebecca M. Gilbreth, 92 Holbert Avenue. Um, Dan Malloy is presenting this one. And uh, if we remember, we this one, uh, we continued from last month for uh, re-noticing um, because the little step up that we noticed in June, I believe, um, ended up changing the height. So, um, I, I, Eleanor, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think much more changed other than that. No, it, it's just, it's going uh, up three feet, six inches, or 3.6 feet yeah. instead of 3.4, which was the original notification or whatever it was, I forget. And we got, no, there was no additional mail based on the re-notification. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, Dan, if you wanna just recap for us where we left off, that would be great. Sure, so at the last meeting, uh, we had a pretty brief discussion. I don't think we had enough members present to go forward. So just a, a recap. So we're raising the building, the light tower up front to comply with building code. In the initial application, when it was reviewed, uh, you didn't have enough information and we had missed a step in the building. So what you have in front of you now is the application to raise the entire building as originally proposed, uh, although now it's going a little bit higher to keep the entrance the lowest, to bring the lowest step at the entrance up to building code requirement. Uh, so the floodplain elevation out there is eight. Building code requires finished floor one foot higher, which would be elevation nine. So we're asking that the lowest finished floor be raised, allowed to be raised up to elevation 9.2 so that gives us about two and a half inches of flexibility when we, when we pick it up. And that will result in a total increase of about 3.6 feet and a building height of around 36.3 feet. Okay. So when I went back through this one, I believe we had you had provided a bunch of information that we had asked for. I believe you had answered all of our questions and I've not, if other board members um, have questions or comments, um, I'd love to hear them. But I think from my, from my um, recollection that we were in a good place with this one, other than just that question of the, the step. The you, did, you did ask that Ethan attend this meeting at the last meeting. Um, there were enough board members. It's just that we realized we had to re-notice. Um, so we didn't really do anything with it last month, but um, I do know I went back to my notes and you had asked that Ethan, and since he's here, if you yeah. have any questions for him, I think you had specific questions about the elevations for both sections of the building and more information about the floor framing and those dimensions. Right, and unfortunately, I think those que those questions were really um, coming from, from Lisa. Um, and Ed, actually. <laughs> both aren't here today. So, and that is, um, so 
I, that's really more their area of expertise. So I really am going to rely, I think, you know, Jeff and Mark and um, Karen, Michael, you guys for that. If anyone Ethan, has. are you through the HTC on this? I we believe he is. HTC has approved everything out here. I just uh, Yes, HTC. Uh, this is Ethan. The HTC approved this. Did, did they approve get that? the elevations that we're talking about now? Yes. And so I think the questions that Lisa had about the flooring was to, to try to, um, where we see that entrance, that little step up to explain, I think, what it looks like on the inside and how that affected the um, <clears throat> Are you talking to me, Ethan? Yes, sorry, Ethan, yes. Uh, we don't know what it is because it's under the building. We assume it's wood. It's an existing building. We're not touching the framing. It's built in the 1850s, 1870s, something like that. So without op without opening up the floors right now, which we don't know what it is. We assume it's wood, like the other lighthouse that's on the right. property. And the, the step up is just inside the building, you're just stepping yeah, just, if you look at the building, there's the the little house that's attached to the front. That's the lower portion, and then you step up into the cylinder of the base of the tower. There's a step in there. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Ethan about his his input on this? No, I'm okay with it. Okay. Um, and is everyone okay? I mean, the two the two inch uh, wiggle room is that enough for us? Are we okay with that? Is that? Well, we had originally asked for more, but the board asked us to reduce that, so we did. I think two inches should be enough. You guys just need to pay attention. Um, is there anyone in the public who wants to talk about this one? Do you have any comments, Eleanor? I don't see anything, no. Okay. So I feel comfortable and um, okay with approving this um, as they requested. Um, they provided all the information that we needed. I appreciate Ethan being here to answer questions as well. Um, I'm glad that in our meeting, we caught the little um, bump out step that caused the increase because that would have been a pain for everybody to have to come back later. Um, I don't have a problem with it. Does any, are the other board matter, uh, members satisfied with all the information we've received and the height that it that it ends up being to satisfy the requirements? Okay, so it seems like nobody has any comments or questions. So I would um, ask a motion to be made to um, approve the relief as requested. Eleanor, do we need to put time limits on this one? Hold on, this is in R1, I think, right? R1, I mean, there is a density issue. Okay. I'm gonna leave that up to you. It, sometimes you do an R1, you always do an ROH and SOH, and you sometimes do an R1 and S1. You can see the proximity to the adjacent structures. Again, I want to leave it up to you based upon the typical elements that would inform that decision, but um, trying to find where you might be able to guesstimate the proximity to adjacent 
I was just looking for I, I page think... one sixteen will give you an idea. That's the GIS. Okay. All right. Um are you, are you referring to construction timeframes? Yes. Yeah, I mean, really, you're probably not going to be able to start until after September anyway, right? <laughs> uh, well, I just want to let everybody know, so the existing house is under renovation as we speak, and the, the lighthouse in the back of the property is all, also under renovation right now, so there's active construction on the property already. Okay. I've So I've gone by this project. I don't, I don't, I don't think we need to put the restrictions on. I just wasn't sure if that was a. No, it's really, it's, it's a case by case in the R1. Um, I think, I think we can pass on this one. But again, I'm one person, if somebody, is, is there anyone in the board that feels like this one should have the, the um, construction restrictions on timeline? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, the other structures do. Right. Um, okay, so so I would ask um, someone to make a motion to approve the relief as requested. So I moved. Make that motion. Okay, so I think I heard um, Jeff and Karen. Um, so let's say uh, Jeff makes the motion. Karen, would you second? Second. Okay. Um, so I will do roll call vote on this one. Um, so myself, I, Michael O'Mara. I. Karim Koseyatak. I. Jeff Thayer. I. And uh, Jim Mondani. I. Great. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so the next one we have, um, we're moving into new business, is 8-20 um, Nantucket Westmore Farms, LLC, 6 and 8 Old Westmore Farm Road. This has, um, applicant has made a request to withdraw without prejudice. Um, so would someone make that uh, motion for them to withdraw without prejudice? Jim, do you wanna make that motion? Wait, you're on mute. There you go. So moved. Okay. And um, Mark, would you second? Second. Okay. So Jim's made the motion. Mark has seconded. I will um, read through the roll call for that one. Michael O'Mara. Aye. Um, Karim Koseyatak. Aye. Uh, Jeff Thayer. Aye. Mark Poor. Aye. And Jim on Danny. Okay, so Susan, you did not vote on that. No. Nope. I just want, I just read through the list. Is that okay? Aye. Aye. I, did, uh, I, I was muted. Aye. Okay. Um, so it's fine if I don't vote, right? It shouldn't be a problem. Uh, yeah. all right, so that request is granted to withdraw without prejudice. So moving on to our next item of new business. This is application 15-20, uh, Mark, Mark M. Dowley and Megan Weissen Dowley, trustee of Megan Weissen Dowley Revocable Trust. Um, this is 31 and 33 North Pasture Lane and Kevin Dale is presenting. Madam Chairwoman and your fellow colleagues, it's good to see all of you in the virtual world. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Dale, I represent Mark and Megan Dowley, trustees who own two lots on North Pasture Lane at 31 and 33 North Pasture Lane. Both lots have merged into one lot for zoning purposes by a mer merger uh, declaration of record. The lots are, the property is located in the LUG3 zoning district, which requires, as you know, a minimum lot size of 120,000 square feet and maximum allowable ground cover of 3% of lot area. Uh, both lots together have an aggregate area of 74,000 
761 square feet and ground cover of 7.4%. Properties non-conforming as to lot size and ground cover requirements, although it does have the benefit of a cluster subdivision special permit that was issued by the Planning Board in the early 80s. My clients asked the board to grant them a special permit pursuant to section 13930 and 33 a of the bylaw to allow them to keep an existing 242 square foot shed on the property. It's a little bit complicated, but the maximum allowable 7% ground cover for this lot is 5,233 square feet. The structures on the lot, including the 242 square foot shed and the 69 square foot sauna, I should say substantially below ground sauna, have an aggregate ground cover of 5,539 square feet. They exceed the allowable ground cover by roughly 306 square feet. But the sauna is going to be located substantially below grade and under our bylaw, such a structure does not count for ground cover. So if that sauna is put below grade, the existing shed would exceed the allowable ground cover by 237 square feet. My clients ask you to issue a special permit to allow them to keep the shed, which would be in effect excess ground cover, although de minimis. And just by way of background, if the shed was smaller, if the shed was 200 square feet, as you know, it wouldn't count towards ground cover because the policy of our town and our bylaw is to exempt sheds 200 square feet or less from ground cover calculations. So if you said, if you deem the, the existing shed, if you gave it the benefit of 200 square feet, in the final analysis, the excess ground cover would be 37 square feet, a very small number. So my clients ask you to issue that special permit to allow them to keep the shed there on the property. They have the support of their direct abutters, Mr. and Mrs. Herbst, also Avis Medwar, who lives in the North Pasture neighborhood, and the trustees of the Homeowners Association support this application. And further, if you grant the relief as requested, my clients would live and agree to a condition that prohibited them or they would waive their right to put a 200 square foot zoning shed exempt from ground cover on the property. And I think that is an indication of their good faith and what they wanna do here. Now, just to cover my bases, in the alternative, my clients ask for a variance to waive the ground cover overage and to permit the shed. They meet the test for a variance because the property itself is unique and different from other lots in this neighborhood. In simple terms, it's twice as large because two lots have merged together and its shape is different, its size is different. Moreover, a little, literal enforcement of the ground cover, maximum ground cover of 7% would cause the, my clients a substantial hardship because the shed exists, the 242 square foot shed exists, it's there, it would force them to take it down. And you can grant variance relief in my opinion because 
what my clients proposed does not undermine the intent and purpose of the bylaw. Effectively, they're asking for 37 square feet. There's no opposition to this application that I'm aware of. There is support, as I mentioned, two letters and the trustees letters. And again, they would forego having any 200 square foot non ground cover zoning shed on the property in the future. So for those reasons, my preference would be that you grant a special permit and allow my clients to proceed and finish their building project. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Kevin, just out of curiosity, how did this all come about? Well, initially my clients wanted more living space for their family, because they have a growing family. So they purchased the abutting lot and they wanted to, in effect, have a compound, a family compound out there in North Pasture. And they discussed it with me and with their architect, Chip Webster, and with their surveyor, Jeff Blackwell. And we all thought the way to do this would be to merge the lots so that they would be able to be afforded more ground cover. And in the plan that they put together, they come up with this de minimis overage of ground cover and came to me and said, well, we really, really, really don't want to take down the existing shed. It's very nice. It works well for us. Is there a way to keep it? And I said, there is, but it takes the wisdom and knowledge of the Board of Appeals to allow you to do it. So that's why I filed the application. Is it a true shed? Is it used as a shed or is it used as something else? You know, and what yeah, kind of foundation system? I have not been out there. I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a well appointed shed. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, Jeff. Thank you. I had the same question, but I was muted. Um, And so the the existing structure that's under construction that that's just a renovation. Yes. And um, talk to me about the substantial the substantially below grade sauna. It says it's going to be in a vault. What is what does that mean? I believe it's going to be buried and be substantially below grade, so it doesn't count for ground cover. So you'd have to step step down. And uh, Eleanor, do you, uh, have you reviewed it? Is that is that correct? The way it's set up. I haven't seen any design plan for this sauna being converted to a below ground structure. Um, I did, as I said in my staff report, go through the building department file mm -hmm. with a fine tooth comb. There is a chart that I put together for you on page. Um, seven of the staff report that iterates the various building permits that I was able to find um, in this merged file. The subject shed was originally supposed to be 240 square feet, but, but it was always going to be larger than a zoning shed. They demoed, they have now demoed the former shed on um, the left lot, the th uh, which I think is 31 North Pasture, was that was supposed to be a 120 foot square foot shed, but ended up being 252 square feet somehow. <laughs> but that's gone. That's been demoed along with a few other non ground cover things. Um, I mean, if you look at the chart, it's pretty pretty detailed. I didn't want to go into major weeds for you, but he's right about the shed being well appointed. There are some elevations shown, and I think I even saw some photographs in the building department file. It's, it's a very nice looking shed. There's no question. It has barn doors that open like that. Well, I, yeah, I, is well appointed an important criteria? No, I think that Jeff was just wondering if it's being used as something else. You know, sometimes people use sheds for. I'd I'd like to know with certainty that 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 the sauna would meet that. 
definition. Is there a way to do that? I mean, what is substantially? Does that mean 51% underground? I, I, I just don't I want to get to the point where it's built it. and then a building inspector says, well, no, it's not. And then we're. we're Maybe we'd there. have to get. Um... Well, that's going to be their problem at the time of the CO. If, if Marcus and the people doing the inspection determine that it is not, quote unquote, substantially below ground, they're going to have the problem of cleaning it up. That's not, I think, frankly, I think that's not. That's but that's come back to us before. Wasn't there a wine cellar that was substantially before under they changed the bylaw? Yeah, yeah. without Tom Nevers. That's right. We all went out and inspected the wine. So I, I don't want to get to a point where then they've installed the spa and then we're getting into an argument of whether it's substantially underground or not. I, I mean, I get that the 242 square foot shed. It doesn't seem like it's a, an old shed that's been on the property that had bicycles and swimming stuff and fishing rods in it. It seems like it's a pretty nice um, situation going on out there. There's also, you know, as far as 2000, it looks like o October of last year, there was a permit taken out for a 959 square foot pool house with bathroom and bar, garage and storage below. Also, um, at that point, there was a permit issued to de demolish the 252 foot square shed deck and pergola. Um, and although the pergola looks like it was permitted for in, well, it's a different one, but in 2018. So it seems like there's been plenty of opportunity to clean up the ground cover out here, or at least be aware of it. Um, it maybe it should have been taken into account when there was uh, the permit for this 959 square foot pool house with the bathroom and bar. Um, and there's no CO issued for that now. Maybe that's why this is coming up because that's open. Um, but, you know, I think the, the, um, the request saying, you know, we'll agree to no zoning shed. I mean, come on, you've already got 242 square feet over plus the, um, the sauna. So, Madam Chair, if I may, first, I might suggest that if you're inclined to grant the relief, that you include a provision in the relief granted that says that the spa will be substantially lower than existing grade. But I think what would, I get what you're saying, Kevin, but I think I think Jim's question, if I'm if I'm understanding him correctly, and of course through Zoom, like it's always difficult, like you know, with the lag and stuff, but I think Jim's question is are saunas allowed to be part of this substantially below grade category? Is that I don't think the bylaw distinguishes and parses which structures can or cannot be below grade. It says finished or unfinished space. If you look at page, again, page seven of the staff report, I cite the definition of ground cover pursuant to 139.2-A. Mm -hmm. And I even highlighted the relevant information for you. So substantially below grade finished or unfinished space. Yeah, but is, this, is a sauna an unfinished space? It's a finished space, I would think. A finished space. I guess. Uh, I guess I would find I would be if 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 we could determine this that it that it was not part of ground cover. I'd get a little closer to being okay with this the overage at that point. But it sounds like it's it's going to be a bit of a subjective determination anyway. Yeah, I'd like to. I don't think we're going to have that answered. The zoning administrator made a very good point. The determination of whether or not this sauna is substantially below grade and therefore exempt from ground cover is a determination for the zoning enforcement officer and the building inspector. They'll make that determination. I'm okay. suggesting that you put a condition in the in the in the, uh, the relief in, in, the, in the document that says it has to be. And if there's a determination by Marcus or Mr. Murphy that it doesn't comply with this decision of the Board of Appeals, then my client's not going to get be able to get a certificate of occupancy. But you know, you have enough problems as a Board of Appeals. You don't have to create new ones and take on what really isn't 
within your jurisdiction, in my opinion. How are you going to access the sauna? I don't know. All I know is the sauna will be below grade substantially, and my client will have to make it accessible so that it passes muster with the building inspector when he inspects it. Because I'm just curious, like the stairs going down to it, like how, like how is that? I don't know. And that's, I think that's outside your purview. I know it's a relevant question, but you know, obviously. The, I mean, I guess then we say, I guess then, yeah, I guess then the, uh, how we could do it is say, okay, well, it's this, the sauna is either doesn't count towards ground cover because it's substantially below grade as determined by the zoning enforcement officer or it goes away. Okay. Yeah, I think that's makes sense. My other, um, my other question is the the existing structure under construction. I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. I mean, I do, but is it is that a new construction? I mean, is there opportunity to to gain some? There's not opportunity to take ground cover away from that structure because it's almost done. We looked carefully at trying to take ground cover away from structures that count as ground cover to offset this 37 square foot overage and weren't able to do so. I guess what I'm getting at, Kevin, is, uh, is um, you know, that standard for the variance about it's going to cost, a, you know, undue financial burden. If they're in the process, is it is it really going to be an a substantial financial burden. Well, they have to. I'm just going to say right now, wait, hold on, Kevin, for the, for the variance, I'm not, I don't think this, I'm not comfortable with this being a variance. Okay. But to, to answer your question, Jim, it would be a substantial hardship for them to remove 42 square feet from the existing shed because effectively they'd have to demolish the shed. I think what he's asking though, Kevin, is, you have a building permit issued uh, in, it seems like October of last year, 2019, for this 959 square foot pool yeah. house with bathroom and bar, whether it was a renovation or a new construction, whatever. At that point, I've, I have the deed here when they purchased the property and their title exam and every, they must have known that they were over ground cover. So that would have been when you were demoing this they must have been even more over ground cover if they demoed a 252 square foot shed and pergola and deck as part of this uh, building permit um, issued in October of 2019, building permit 0058. So it, it kind of feels like they should have cleaned this up then. Well, to be clear, I represented the Dallies when they purchased this lot. Mm -hmm. They did not know they were over ground cover when they purchased the lot. They didn't know they were going to be over ground cover until mid-winter, early spring of this year, when we sat down together with Jeff Blackwell and Chip Webster to look at everything and look at the project plan and mm -hmm. try to determine what to do. And we deduced that the way to go forward would be to ask for the minimus special permit relief from the zoning board to, in effect, allow... 37 square feet that no one opposes, that fits under the, the, the uh, standard of, of proof for 139.33A2 for pre existing non conforming conformities that you can have excess ground cover. When you push through this, we're asking for 37 square feet of ground cover on a 75,000 square foot lot. Madam Chair? Yeah. I spent so much time in this building firm file, I've gotten to know it intimately. And one thing that I didn't mention in my staff report, and I chose not to do so because I didn't have Marcus here to ask the question. Mm -hmm. It was late. But um, on the permit, that's if you go back to, oh boy, page seven of the staff report, the chart, there's a building permit number 71817. Yes. Um, I'm looking at it. It's for replace window with door, add deck, outdoor shower and tub, new pergola and outdoor fireplace on 31 North Pasture. So that's map 44, parcel 78. Mm -hmm. And there's a note. I'm, 
and you probably can't see it, but let's see if you can. From it's Mark, it's, yeah. is it too blurry? I'm sorry. But anyway, it says, uh, it's in Marcus's scratch, something over GC, 2,547% allowed, 2,604 built by current GC rules, 2,902 with 252 square foot shed plus 69 sauna. Shed permitted at 120 square feet, replaced without permit between 2003, 2007. And then there's a note over that written by someone who works uh, up front in the pit. After CO is issued, return to markets for permit review dated November 6, 2018, and it's sort of crossed out. And then the permit itself has a final signature. There's no CO, there wouldn't typically be a CO for this kind of work. So I didn't know what to make of that, um, but it, Marcus did pick up on this at some point. I just don't know what date his note was. I mean, this permit was applied for in, I can see why, why this was applied for in April 2017. And he did sign it in May 2017. And then there's this note. I just don't know what date the note is, but again, the final permit is signed off. So, And, and these people bought this property in 2014. No, we bought this property last year. They're noted on that, on that application. Okay, I have a deed here. They own a lot, they've owned a lot, one lot there for 20 years. Yeah, 31, it says 31 North Pasture. It's the, I see a deed August of 2004, or June of 2014. Yeah, that, that permit was for that lot that they've owned for longer. Correct. Right, I'm just saying that's where they changed it to the trust. I'm just, I'm only saying that for purposes of these building permits. They changed it to the trust and after the fact, last year, they bought 33 North Pasture. Mm -hmm. Merged 33 with 31. Right. And that's where we are today. So going back to Eleanor's point about the cryptic writing of Marcus on this permit, That refers to the 252 square foot shed that was removed. It doesn't refer to the 242 square foot shed at issue that's located at 33. It seems yeah, like I, referring to the, the 120 square foot shed that then ended up being higher. But regardless, I thought my understanding from your presentation was that they had, their goal was to build a family compound and, and that's why they bought the second lot and merged it. So, it just seems like if that was your goal, you would want to make sure that you had the ability to build a family compound and, and the fact that you're over, you know, you're over on ground cover already. It doesn't really seem like this was the. Well, they didn't know they were over ground cover until they sat down with their advisors, their architect and their surveyor and looked at everything and realized that if they kept a 242 square foot shed, they would be over ground cover effectively by 37 square feet. And that's why we're before you today. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something they knew a long time ago. It's something that came about recently. We tried to sit down and hammer out a solution. And I think that it was important to my clients to talk to all of their neighbors, to make sure that everyone in North Pasture was on board that nobody opposed what they wanted to do and to come into this hearing in good faith to ask for a special permit where we meet the burden of proof for a special permit, specifically under 139.33a2. All of those factors we meet, it's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than what's there now to grant 37 square feet of ground cover. You're not undermining the zoning bylaw it's some. Uh, it's it's been done again and again, countless times by this board, to grant this kind of relief. So, I think it's fair for you to grant a special permit. I understand why you have more qualms about a variance. That's a different, more difficult standard. But here, we fit right into the special permit rubric. Um. So Eleanor, I did not see I did not see any um, mail opposing this application. That's correct. no, no mail. And and to re return to that thing I just brought up, 
Kevin's absolutely right. That note from Marcus would have preceded their acquisition of the now merged adjacent parcel. So that note from Marcus was absolutely relevant to the single lot known as 31 North Pasture because his calculations and his numbers refer only to what would have been allowed on that lot, not the combined lot area. So that's kind of why I didn't want to mention it, but it's there's been a ground cover issue. Well, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, the lots merged, so you you consider them one lot. So that it that but that would have preceded his yeah. notations would have preceded the merging. Yeah, no, and I understand why you didn't put it in the staff report because it's just a note. It's a, it could be misconstrued either way. You know, right? Well, I get that. Um, I'd like to hear from other board members. Um, anyone? Have any questions for Mr. Dale? I don't really have a question, but I do want to point out, which is probably what everybody else is thinking. It seems like there was a lack of due diligence here, and now everyone's trying to rush and clean it up. Um, I there's a lot going on on that property. I mean, I'm looking at it right now. There's there's a lot. Um, I know 37. Square feet doesn't sound like a lot, but it does open up a bad precedent for the future. So not really, uh, not really, I can't really support this one, to be honest with you. Well, I don't think, I think in fairness to the applicant, there wasn't lack of due diligence. When the applicant realized there was a ground cover issue, he sought, my client sought good professional advice to find out what they could do to keep the shed. Obviously they can take the shed off the property, but it seems like that would be an egregious overstep for them to have to do it. And it granting this special permit relief doesn't set any adverse precedent whatsoever because this board has granted this kind of special permit for de minimis ground cover overages for the past 40 years. So, all I'm asking, if you make a decision, it's based on facts, not on presumptions about not acting in good faith, not pursuing things with due diligence. I'm here to say they did, they talked to their advisors, their attorney, their architect, and their surveyor. And that's why we're here. Just like everyone else comes to this board for relief, when they meet the test, to get the relief. And there's nothing that's been said or presented today that indicates these applicants should not get the relief. There's no finding that what they propose to do is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than what's there now. In fact, it's the opposite. The neighbors have said it would be a substantially good thing to allow the shed to stay. And that's the standard to look at. And not to, to uh, suggest I'm sorry. sorry to interrupt. I just want to clarify, it's not going to be a 37 square foot overage, it's going to be a 237 square foot overage. Well, you know, thank you for the clarification. That is, if you discard the uh, long standing, at least 10 year policy of the town to exempt 200 square foot sheds from ground cover. Except, ah! except this isn't a 200 uh, I understand, I'm just, what I'm trying to say is, there's a policy of this town to exempt 200 square foot sheds. And if you apply that policy to this case, what you're really doing, you could say to the applicants, reduce your 242 square foot shed by 37 square feet. And then you'll comply completely with 7% ground cover. They know that. They no. just do it. It's not feasible. No, no it has to be 200 square foot shed. The, the, the other, the point, the other, I get what you're saying, but the argument you're making is then anybody who has a shed, it could be, it that then 200 square feet goes out the window. You're only counting the extra square feet. It's a 200 square foot shed. It's not a, you, it doesn't translate into a, uh, a, it's a 250 square foot shed. And we say, okay, well, it only counts. You get no, two. That's not my point. My point is, for you asking you to adopt and recognize that there is a policy in this town not to count 200 square foot sheds as ground cover. That's a policy. I'm not saying that you have to apply it here, but I think you ought to take cognizance of it 
when you make a decision. Eleanor is exactly right. Right now, if the bar is sunk, sunken into the ground, it doesn't count towards ground cover. Literally, there's a 237 square foot overage. But if you apply the policy that exempts 200 square feet of shed, it's 37 square feet. Oh, stop we, it, Kevin. Um, my, so I just want to, I don't even view this as a shed issue, <laughs> right. believe it or not. There's a 900, really, you were in compliance until you put the 900 square foot pool house. Everything was in compliance. We're, we're the chronology, we're mixing up the chronology where the, the shed was fine on the property. Your client bought the property. Everything was in compliance. And then they're in the still in the process of building a 900 square foot pool house, which is putting everything uh, out. And that's something that I still believe can be altered. And, and, and I'm not sure we would have approved it if you came to us before. You're asking for forgiveness now. But when, when you went through the process for the 900 square foot pool house, then the special permit should have been asked for to be over on the 900 square foot pool house. I agree. I don't know. I well, agree. Let me but I see, where, I see where you're coming, how you're coming at it. And I'm not asking for forgiveness. I'm asking for zoning relief in accordance with the bylaw where we meet the burden of proof. You're That's asking for, you're okay. asking for, or, or, okay, you're asking for it on the 900 square foot pool house. No, that 900 square feet is irrelevant to this application. It's irrelevant. It'll put you over. I, yeah, well, I don't. I, I think it is relevant. I think it is relevant, and I think that th I agree with Jim. This is it's not really a shed issue. This is a numbers issue, and we're trying to move numbers around, and we're we're focusing on the shed. But the fact is, there is a 2019 permit for a 959 square foot pool house. So um, I think I'm going to ask now if there's any members from the. Uh, or actually, is anyone else on the board um, wanting to make a comment on this application? I have a question. Um, sure, Michael. Go ahead. Um, regarding the, I just want to make sure we're calling a, a, a sauna, sauna instead of a spa, because a sauna is an enclosed area and a spa is, is not necessarily. Um, and so a, a sauna would need a, a walls and a roof and a floor in it. And I'm not sure how you get that below grade. And if it was a spa, then it wouldn't be ground cover. And there's a spa. a spa on the property. And, and Kevin, let me clarify. I said ask for forgiveness. That's probably, a, that's the wrong statement, but you probably would have come before or when you went through the approval for the 900 square foot. Let me, let me just, but maybe this clarifies things. When my clients applied for the 900 square foot pool house, they realized they would be over ground cover and they removed structures that counted towards ground cover to try to get down to the maximum allowable ground cover of 7%. And they realized to do that, literally, they'd have to take 42 square feet off the shed and deem the shed to be a non ground cover shed. I thought it was something they could have done. But effectively, it meant if they did that, they'd have to take this 242 square foot shed off the property. And they said, you know, we really want, don't want to do that. It's well appointed. Everyone likes it. No one's complaining about it. What can we do to keep the shed? But what they could have done easily was reduce the ground cover of the 959 foot pool house. It but that's a fake of plea. That's ancient history. That's been done. The 900 square feet is built. But, but you're saying right now that they recognized they were over ground cover. They took away other structures, but they didn't want to get rid of this 242. So, because they like it. So now they're trying to morph it into a zoning shed. And it just, I just, I- I'm not trying to morph it, doesn't, it into a zoning it shed. No, they're not. They realized, yeah, yeah. They realized that the shed was over ground cover recently. Not when the 900 square foot building. Oh, stop yes, it. Window, no, it's true. But you and just. I, I, I'm, I'm here to tell the truth. And when we met in January, that's when the issue came up. Not before that. 
Kevin, how did they even get a building permit for that 932 foot additional structure with the setup the way it is now? What, it wasn't flagged at the building department then, it was clearly over ground cover. I don't think it was over ground cover because they, they took off other structures. And I can't answer your question directly because Chip Webster got the building permit, I did not. But I'm here to talk about special permit relief and whether it's justified or not. And if you're inclined not to grant the relief, I'd like to see the, what their specific findings are based on your declination to grant the relief. So we'd have some chance to appeal. So when it comes to the, the uh, requirements for the special permit, yes. um, subsection C, when they built the, they put the plans together the 950 square feet, did that meet the dimensional requirements of the zoning bylaws at that point? Does it meet that particular criteria? Because I think it put you over at that point and you, you didn't meet the, the zoning. Yeah, but why, I, the, my, my response to that is, why is that relevant to the special permit? It's, it's relevant the criteria, to the isn't it? Yeah. No, I mean, my, my job is to say, is to present this to say that it's a non-conforming lot. There's surplus ground cover. We ask relief to keep the surplus ground cover. And the grant relief is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than what's there now. That's the test. I guess what I, I'm getting at, I'm looking through my notes here, but uh, does the new structure conform to the other dimensional requirements of the chapter? Yes. 900 square feet, 20, 50 square feet. Okay. So, if we have, Eleanor, we had no public comment. No, let me refresh. No. Um, we have support for, for the application. Right, right. I just- No uh, opposition. Yes, but Kevin, we also have, um, we have like the YouTube public comment where someone who's- I understand. In the party could comment. So I just wanna make sure like we would say, at the meeting, you know, if there's anyone in the room who'd like to speak about this, I just like to give the anyone an opportunity to speak. Um, I think that we have exhausted um, the conversation on this one, um, unless any of the board members have anything additional they'd like to add. Um, I personally am not inclined to uh, to vote for this um, to approve the relief requested. Um, but I'm one person. So if someone would like to make a motion, um... I believe we have to do it in the affirmative. Yeah. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the application as requested. Okay. So um, I I'll will... second. Oh, wait. Madam, wait. Madam Chair, as a point of order, Specify. if I may. Specify special permit, please, or variance. Uh, do we have to we vote on both or just can we vote? Well, Kevin, you wanted special permit relief, correct? I want both, but what I do want is for everyone who votes to give the reasons, the basis for their findings to vote yes or no. I don't believe we have to do that. I think you do have to do that. Uh, Eleanor, I, in, the, in, the, in the 11 years I've been on this board, I've never had to do that once. I can't. If you feel a special permit is not warranted here, you have to say why. Well, when I have written decisions based upon a denial, so you have a, a affirmative motion, it doesn't pass, so it's a denial. Mm -hmm. And then in the body of the decision, I recap the discussion. And in so doing, in that narrative, the reasons for which you end up declining to, to approve are fleshed out. Well, I'd right. like to hear what those reasons are today. Well, I think you've heard the reasons, Kevin. I well, mean- What are they? The reasons, for, <laughs> my reasons, if you, if you need to have it pulled out are, 
I do need to have it pulled out. I don't, I, I don't see how a, um, how a sauna without any, um, this is a point of order. It's a spa, not a sauna. Sorry. It says sauna on it. Well, it's, I'm telling you it's a spa. Okay. Well, okay. Well then there's two, there's two things on the plan. One is an existing spa and one is an existing one story wood frame structure. That's a sauna that's 69 square feet. So which one are we talking about? Because the existing spa doesn't even have dimensions on it. We're talking, we're talking about the existing wood frame structure sauna. Sauna. But right. I think it's a spa. But oh. go ahead, pull out your reasons on voting no. I don't really appreciate the way you're talking to me right now, but. Um, uh, Madam Chair, we actually don't. I apologize. Have I apologize. I yeah, apologize. I, agree. I, don't, I don't think we need to go through our reasons. I think we've stated them throughout the discussion and they'll be pulled out in the minutes. I'm dense. I don't remember what they were. What were they? Okay. The, the, it, from the board, not from, obviously this isn't from the minutes, but we'll have those written for full review. Uh, what I'm hearing from my board and, and my, my um, hesitance in this is that the property was over ground cover. There was a permit pulled in 2019 to build or a 959 square, uh, square foot structure, which could have been lowered to, to uh, meet ground cover. Um, from your testimony of what the, the timeline of events of what happened with the applicant, I, I hate to say it seems like it's changed a few times, but the, the, the timing of when the applicant became a, uh, aware of this and things that they did to try to minimize ground cover um, and that the, the uh, I get that they wanna keep their shed, but you don't, there is a reason we have a maximum ground cover and there is a difference between this and the 200 square foot zoning shed. Um, and I just believe that the, I believe that it, without two, that they could have met ground cover without going this route and that we do not need to um, provide a special permit um, when there has been um, activity on the property that could have, could have, have made them meet the ground cover requirements. And if this was a situation where they bought the properties at merged, the shed's been there for a million years and, um, and, 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 and they were planning to do something in the future, but they wanted to try to clean stuff up. But I, that's, that's, my, that's where I'm coming from. So, I understand. And I, I wanna publicly apologize to you, Susan, again, for being abrupt. Like and it's I'm frustrating. Still, but I wanna be clear, I have to say this. Everything you just said, in my opinion, does not relate to the burden of proof that my clients have to get the special permit. 139.33A2 sets out the criteria. The criteria are not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. It's essentially the, the special permit finding. There's mm -hmm. nothing I heard today that says this shed is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. In fact, we have neighbors supporting it. Well, it also says, and it's not, or like, that's one of the, that's one of the prongs, but the fact that this is over ground cover and was over ground cover and could have been remedied. I don't think that that, you know, to be, I don't think that has anything to do with special permit relief. I think it has something to do with variance relief. Well, I appreciate your, um, your reading of it, but it, it doesn't change my reasoning. But again, I'm one person. So, um, Karen, you were making a motion in the affirmative? Uh, correct. Okay. And does someone want to set a motion? Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I just need to be real clear since uh, we see where this is going. Are we making a motion for special permit relief pursuant to 139.33A2? Yes. Okay. 
Um, do we have to do that or do we want to do the variance? You can make a motion for each separately. You shouldn't make it. They should be separate motions. Okay. Because he asked for in the alternative variance relief. Yeah, I think we should do the special permit first and then do the variance. So Kira made that motion? So Kira made a motion to approve the special permit relief as requested by the applicant. Okay. Um, so let's see. So I think I'm going to have, I think um, I'll go through the roster. I'll start with myself. I'm sorry, who seconded? I'm sorry, this is getting so much. Oh, sorry. I don't think anybody did. Jim, did you second or am I, did we skip over that? I don't think it was seconded. I think you're right. Oh, okay. So would, would someone second it, please? Yeah, take it now. Okay. Second. Okay. So, um, sorry, Kara made the motion, Michael seconded, and I'm going to do a roll call vote. Um, so myself, nay. Michael O'Mara? Nay. Karim Kosayatak? Nay. Jeff Thayer? Nay. And Jim Mondani? This is for the special permit, correct, or the variant? Special permit. Uh, nay. Okay. Um, so that... Five nays. Five days. And then um, would someone make the motion to uh, approve the variance relief as requested? So moved. Okay, and again, I'll go to roll call. Uh, myself, Susan McCarthy, nay. Michael O'Mara? Nay. Karim Kosayatek? Nay, and I think we need to get a uh, second on that too. Oh, I didn't say, I'm sorry. That's all right. Sorry, we can start over. So. Um, who made the motion? I did. And, Karen. and who would second Karen's motion? I'll second it. Thank you, Jim. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so uh, Karen made the motion. Jim seconded it. Um, I will start a roll call myself. Nay. Michael O'Mara? Nay. Karen Pasetak? Nay. Jeff Thayer? Nay. And Jim Mondani? Nay. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to our next application. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, so our next Our next application is 16-20, David M. Brandt, Jr., Diane Tipton Brandt, trustees, the 123 Madigat Road Nominee Trust, uh, Whit Gifford is 123 Madigat Road, and Whit Gifford is representing. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Sure. Madam Chair. Oh. Yeah? I will not be sitting on this. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Okay, Whit, if you'd like to go ahead, that'd be great. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairman. Um, representing David and Diane Bratt, uh, 123 Madiket Road. Um, they own a pre-existing non-conforming structure on that site. Um, the pre-existing non-conformity is the fact that they're over ground cover. Um, they are seeking to uh, remedy that situation slightly uh, through a uh, building project that is actually going to shrink the nonconformity um, by a net of uh, uh, 21 square feet of overage. They currently have 4.12% um, ground cover in the lug two zone, which allows them four. Uh, after their reduction of 122 feet of existing house and the 
addition of 91 square feet of new construction, uh, they will be at 4.09%, uh, um, thereby getting closer to the 4%, but still being slightly non-conforming. Um, there is a, uh, a late a letter in support from a Richard Holt, who is uh, the owner of 121 Matic Road, which is immediately to the right when you're looking at the premises from the, uh, from the road. Um, happy to drill down through the percentages and the square footage numbers if necessary, but um, the question that was indeed raised by Eleanor in the staff report uh, regarding how much of the second floor addition should be properly included uh, web, due to the fact that whether it's a overhang or not, only 28 square feet is actually overhanging because of the fact that that's the little portion that's gonna be over the porch. The rest of that second floor addition is going to be flush with the rest of the structure. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Okay. Does anyone on the board have a question? I just want to read through this really quickly. Oh, it talks about, so did you see what in the staff report where it talks about the discrepancy between the plan and the addendum? Right, the, we're working off of the plans that Bracken has given us that he was working off the CAD drawings from Mark Gutone. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the proposed first floor addition 63, that's that square, you know, carved in square, the, Proposed second floor addition at 28 is that even smaller one right next to it that because it's over the newly created porch below it, it's mm -hmm. only 28 feet um, that's included. And so if you add the 28 plus the 63, you get a total of 91 square feet. Mm -hmm. And if you subtract 91 from the 110 uh I'm sorry, 112 portion of the existing house to be removed, you get the delta of 21 square feet. So in other words, the 28 square feet was meant to be included in the addendum. I just wanted to, I wasn't clear because he didn't put overhang, he just put second floor. But right. clearly that's what he meant. I just right. wanted to be very clear about it because it wasn't specific. Right, and it's, it's, it's tough to tell on the size of the scale that we're, we're looking at. The whole front of that, part that's now going over what is the garage comes all the way to the edge of the garage, except for this little 28 square foot part that hangs out over the porch. So Eleanor, just after going back and forth like that, the, the, the number that we are concerned with is the 28. Hold on, hold on. Mark. Um, I think that the number that she might be, con that, that she's concerned about is whether the net decrease is 21 square feet or if we reclassified the overhang, we'd have. Uh, the decrease of uh, 49 square foot net decrease. And I think we have to use the larger figure for, I mean, we have to include the 28 square feet in the amount that it is being uh, added to so yeah. that we really do only have 21 square feet of addition. Correct. So you're going with the, the total net, in, the 91 square feet foot addition subtracted from the 112 leaves you with a 21 square foot overage overall. Right. The 3355, which is existing, minus the 3334 gives us a 21 square foot delta. Okay. Okay, I, I've got it in my, I've got what I need. I just wanted to make sure I had it right before 
Um, does anyone on the board have any questions for WIT right now? No? Okay, I'm just reading over the section here. And this construction has not begun yet, correct? Correct. Um, they have, since the application was submitted, received um, the certificate of appropriateness from um, the HDC, but no work has been started. Okay. And um, there, you're not, the new work that's being done will confirm, confirm, con sorry, conform to all applicable front, rear, and side set setback requirements? That is correct. Okay. Um, so because you guys are making the effort, um, To reduce, and you couldn't reduce it to get rid of the last 21 square feet? Not in keeping with the design. I mean, they're basically taking the two car garage, shrinking it to a one car garage, and then adding the uh, zoning shed as the second bay, if you will. I mean, they're mm -hmm. trying to do as much as they can, staying within as much of the footprint as they can um, to, to be you know, good neighbors and whatnot, but also uh, not completely tear the entire front of their house off. Right. And this is a legally pre-existing non-conforming structure. That is correct. Okay. So um, in reading, I'm sure you other board members have read as well, the re relief being requested is under section um, 139.33a.4. Uh, um, I, I believe that this applicant meets the criteria for that. Again, and one person, I'd love to hear from some other board members if they have any questions, concerns, or any comments about 139.33A4. Anybody? Eleanor, do you, besides the letter that we received with the, at the back of the staff report supporting it, do we have any public comment on this one? Comment. I'm sorry, what? No, you do not. Okay. Um, well, if, if the board ha have no questions, uh, for what, I do wish that this plan was a little bit bigger and easier to read. I understand with the, you know, doing Zoom, we don't have full size plans in front of us. Um, I can put it on the screen and zoom in for you if you want. I, yeah, that would be helpful just if, and because we don't have any, um, and we don't have any like design plans or elevations. Uh, no, they did not include those, but I want to correct, I misspoke earlier. I meant to say the net decrease was 21 square feet. So the overage at the end of the day will be 75 square feet. Okay. No, with a plus or minus next to it. All right, let me share. Um, right, that's the decrease because it was. Right, the, it was 30, the, the, the structure was 3355. The structure as redesigned and proposed is 3334, meaning that it's 21 square feet less of ground cover. Okay, well, you want but, me to show that, Susan? The, but, what, sorry, but 75 feet over the allowed ground cover. Ground cover correct. Which is a decrease in what it was. Correct. Okay, can you see that? Uh, I mean, yeah, but it's, yeah. Hold on, I'll zoom in. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. So you can see the 112 square foot portion right. of the existing house being removed mm -hmm. as a double cross hatch. And then the 
second floor addition at 28 feet plus the proposed first floor addition at 63 feet right in there where Eleanor's circling it. Oh, right, I see, okay. okay. And, and you know, to your point, Susan, it, it's not like it's at the end of an eave or something that could be lopped off. Right, so the first floor addition is both of those little rectangles and the second floor is just the overhang, is that what you're saying? Correct. Thank you, Eleanor, for sharing that. Um, so if, if the board members don't have any questions or comments, would someone care to make um, to make a motion for this one? I'll make a motion to approve the special permit as requested. Okay, so that's Karen. And would someone care to second that one? I'll second it. Okay, so Jeff seconds. Okay, so we can just vote down the line. Um, Susan McCarthy, aye. Karen Posayatak? Aye. Jeff Thayer? Aye. Um, so that's one, two, three. Uh, Mark Poor? Aye. And Jim Mondani? Aye. Okay, so that motion carries. Okay, thank you, Whit. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. No problem. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so our next application is 17-20, um, Robert C. Crowley, Jane P. Quirk, and William M. Quirk, tr trustee of the John A. Confalone 1994 Revocable Trust. This is 30 Cliff, Ro Cliff Road, and John Brescher is presenting. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, uh, or Madam Chair. As, as you correctly identified, we have, uh, I'm representing the, the owner applicant of 30 Cliff Road, which is Robert C. Crowley, Jane P. Quirk, and William M. Quirk as trustees of the John A. Confalo 1994 Revocable Trust. And we are here, you t uh, we are here before you today for um, a request for special permit relief pursuant to Nantucket Zoning Bylaw Section 13933A1A. Um, in this instance, just as a, a very brief overview, uh, the applicants are requesting to alter the pre-existing non-conforming structure simply by lifting it in its same location and placing a crawl space and basement beneath the structure in the same location as shown on the attached site plan. Um, so the 30 Cliff Road, the premises is it's non-conforming with respect to frontage and side yard setbacks as shown on the attached plan. Uh, it's only got 47.75 feet of frontage in the ROH. Uh, it means 50 feet of frontage. It's been there forever and a day. It's a lot of record. Um, furthermore, the, the single family dwelling is as close as one foot from the nearly side yard lot line in the zoning district that requires five foot side and rear yard setback. Um, the structures and the lot predate the adoption of the zoning bylaw, so these are considered pre-existing non-conforming. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the intention for the, uh, for the owners and applicants is to literally lift the building up in its same location, um, Put, it, put a crawl space and basement beneath and put it down. Um, there would be a vertical expansion of about eight inches. Uh, I, uh, at the time the ap application, the application was submitted, we did not have HDC approval. We do have that approval and I can pull up the COA number in just a minute and get that for you. Um, in the staff report. Oh, it's in the staff report. Thank you, Eleanor, even better. Um, and uh, sort of as, and, and again, as part of the construction, lift it up, put the basement crawl space down, put it back down in, in the location. Um, so we have, we've attached a, a shoring plan. Um, they've, uh, they have Atlantic Aeolus uh, on board to do the work. Um, Mike Day is itch, itching to get it started. Um, so we've, we've attached that um, construction methodology and shoring plan. Uh, we've received uh, letters of support from the direct abutters, um, sort of explaining, uh, we explained the process, the construction process and um, the methodology, and they have given their support for, for the work to be done. Um, and as I said, we have the methodology, we have the, um, uh, the shoring plan, uh, which we, was included in your packet. Um, and I think just as importantly, uh, if you look on it, the exhibit C of our, of the application, 
um, the, the structure is being compromised. Uh, this is one of those instances where sort of time is of the essence to get this done. Um, anecdotally, doors that would normally have opened within the house are not opening quite as easily because the house is um, sort of sinking and just becoming compromised. So as a result, uh, the owner's applicants want to lift it up, get, get it all secured by putting the basement and the uh, crawl space beneath it and putting it back down up on the same location. Um, let's see, I was hoping that Mike might be here to answer any questions, but I'm not sure I see him on the, uh, on the Zoom chat. Um, but if you have any questions for me in the meantime, I'm happy to answer them. And the, uh, the owners, applicants, the quirks are on the chat as well, if you have any questions for them. Uh, John, when are they planning on doing the work? Uh, Karen, the, <laughs> God's honest truth is as soon as possible. So it would be done um, ideally, like say October. And, 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 be, and be finished for next summer. So this, this would effectively be a fall winter project. That's correct. And uh, does, uh, in the methodology, do you, do you have an idea of how long everything will take from as far as the, uh, the shoring, closing down any streets, anything of that nature? I think Mike might have dialed in by phone. Mike, are you on the? I don't. I don't see him here. Oh wait, um, hold on. Yes, yes, hold on, hold on. Oh. He was waiting. I he just. Oh, all right. There he is. Out of the queue. Michael, can you hear us? It says that he's connecting to audio on my on my. Okay. okay. So, hopefully, in a minute. Great. Maybe. Um, maybe still connecting. Oh. Mike, are you there? I see him, but it doesn't say that he, it doesn't show the audio. Mm -hmm. So, well, um, oh wait, here he is, I'll, here. Oh no, that's on there. Now he's, <clears throat> maybe he'll, I don't know, he, he bounced out. I suppose worst case he can call he can call me and I can patch him in through a phone this way if that if that works. Yeah. Um, I understand the process very well actually. Um, the neighbors to number th uh, thirty two have expressed their support. Um, their their property will be impacted. In fact, there's no way around it. Uh, are they aware of that? You want me to answer that, uh, John? Please, Bill. Yes, I mean, we have made the individuals at 32 Cliff aware of this. We've told them that we are gonna have to put shoring. They are very aware of the, the close proximity of the two houses. And we've explained to them that we are gonna put shoring in several places. And that's quite frankly, that's one of the reasons we decided to do a crawl space and a full the crawl space is just in the front in order to minimize the amount of excavation. So when we were originally contemplating the plan, we were thinking about doing a full basement, but in order to minimize any potential impact, that's why you see two thirds of the project is crawl space in the front and the full basement is just in the back for that very reason. But the plan is to put shoring any place where uh, we think there, you know, there could be any concern. Have you done any kind of a, a building survey of 32? Have you identified you know, where it is elevation wise, just in case there's any settling or anything like that? I think that, I think that would be the next step. We didn't want to start engaging anyone until we got through the, the, these first two permitting process, the HDC, which we just received, and then the one today. So that would be the next step um, to do that as well. I think that's probably a good idea um, yep. because you will in fact impact that property to some degree. Mike Day is very, very, very careful. Not much. If Mike Day is not so careful, it could, you know, it really could impact it quite a bit. So yeah. I would, I would certainly hire an engineer to do a survey of that building. 
I would, I would take photographic evidence um, and really to protect yourself more than anybody else. And okay. Michael's yep. back in the waiting room. So let's see if we can get him back on. Are you there, Mike? Hi, John. I'm here. Ah, terrific. There's some there questions there that you can help answer. Um, Jeff, sure. you want to ask Mike all those questions that you were? Uh, sure. Hey, Mike, it's Jeff there. I'm just, uh, I'm just making the point that you will, in fact, impact the property at number 32 Cliff Road to some degree. Even if you do put the shoring right on the property line, you're still, you know, you may potentially have some issues. I, I would suggest that you guys do a survey of that adjacent property. I would suggest that you make the owners of that adjacent property, you know, very aware that there will be some impact to their property. That's all. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, we're going to work over there, probably doing a lot of handwork in order to get that shoring in right on the edge. Um, mm -hmm. We were going to work with our engineer to go over there and meet with the homeowners and just tell them what we were doing, have them inspect their house and foundation before we started. And at that point I can talk about um, that shoring on that Northeast edge, I guess it would be at that point. I think that's a good idea. Great. Okay. Um, is there any concern with board members with this, the one that the um, corner between on page 203 between D and C, that's one inch. Um, and that, you know, obviously we don't want that to get any closer. Um, but that if we're, you're picking it right up and putting it right down, that should, you, you don't have, there isn't much wiggle room to start with. Um, but is there any concern about that moving closer? It's actually one foot. And oh, sorry, one foot. Sorry. It shouldn't. It shouldn't move any closer if the building goes straight up and straight down. Um, we we could uh, you know, have it. You know, have it. Have it surveyed. Make sure exactly. that the foundation is not only plumbed, but make sure a surveyor, you know, before you pour walls, make sure that is is in fact still one foot from that property line. I would I would assume that we'd have Jeff Blackwell out there again before anything is done to shoot sort of the before, during, and after, so we don't. So we're not. So we're not back before you a couple of months from now saying, oops, we're yeah. a few inches. I Great. think that is the intention. That is the intention. Okay. Um, and I saw in the packet letters of support from both 28 and 32 Cliff Road. Um, and um, we have the notes from the Historic Structures Advisory Board and the minutes from the um, HTC. Um, do, are any there are board members, any other questions that you guys might have before I ask if there's any public comment? Okay, Eleanor, do we have any public comment on this one? No, we do not. Okay. Um, I think you know, looking at the pictures and the, the notes and the, um, the, uh, the, the zoning bylaw, I think this, I'm ready to vote on this one if someone wants to make a motion. I just, if I may have a quick question. Sure. Uh, in the past, and John has ha happens to have been before this board with several of these types of applications, <laughs> kind of yeah. an expert now. He knows that we are very adamant about the construction protocols and methodology and you will recall properties in Sconston and in town where we have attached exhibits mm -hmm. approval with the details of the construction methodology. Um, this sort of PowerPoint thing he sent me is a little more involved than I would typically attach as an exhibit, but uh, I can use that as an exhibit to, you know, because I would put subject to certain conditions such as, you know, obviously construction moratorium here. Yeah, I think we usually, we usually like, um, like we, usually we like a letter, right? More of a letter format that's signed by someone who's put together, who's made the, like 
made the presentation put together. So if this is coming from, um, is this coming from Al? either Al or Mike? I think it would be good to get an engineer involved, you guys, and let him and let him weigh in on this, and more so to protect yourselves. Um, yeah, we would we would plan on doing that. Yep. Yeah. So, are you suggesting, Jeff, that we um, either hold, like hold the decision for the attaching of a letter from an engineer? I think we need to do that. I think the building department will probably look for some sort of a letter from a structural engineer or, or a geotech of some sort, you know, outlining the shoring, you know, operations and, and, and him taking some degree of responsibility for it as part of the building permit application. I don't feel we have to hold that. You know, okay. That I was just saying, because to, to Eleanor's point, we have included that as an exhibit on other ones, but has that come from the engineer, Eleanor, or has it just come from the contractor? Uh, in one instance, the attorney, and it happened to have been John, drafted something based upon the information he got from contractors, engineers, and geoengineers. And in another one, there was a letter signed by an engineer. It's been a little bit varied, but they've all pretty much detailed, you know, a, a button, a, sort of a bucket list of things that had to take place. Everything to do with the shoring to traffic control, to uh, providing the number of the contract, the GC to the uh, abutters that would be impacted. There's a quite a laundry list of things. So I can take one of the old ones and, and tailor it to this. The, I believe that's all in the construction methodology insuring plan. It talks about um, police details being arranged, yes. uh, the contractors be available to the abutters via the phone, their phone numbers and emails are there, et cetera. So I believe it's, they're it's all- very it's very thorough. <laughs> so, so Eleanor, is it more a question of um, of not content, but of presentation? Like, do you want John to put it in a letter form? Well, I could even go so far as to say, subject to the construction methodology and showing okay. plan as uh, uh, submitted with the application. That's what it, how it was done. Yeah. Michael, remember in the old days, decisions just said. Okay. Subject to, uh, so we could do it that way. And if anybody has questions, it's just, this is one of the most elaborate attachments I've seen exhibits it's not usually so elaborate and I appreciate it but I don't want to include it as an exhibit to a decision it's too much okay okay so so we can forego that or we can just say subject to the yes um and so we want the construction the limit the date limit it looks like they're already planning to start in October Right. I think, I think that's right. Mike, Mike, if you don't mind, when, what, what's sort of your schedule and how long do you think this whole process may or may not take? Uh, I, would, I would say if we started about beginning or mid-October, I think the process would probably take, I would say, three months, two to three months um, for going up, excavation, new foundation, coming back down and backfilled. <clears throat> so three months to be fair. <clears throat> Okay, so that should be no problem then if we put the um, restriction dates on there. Um, are there any other conditions that anyone thinks we need to have on this? Um, I, I have one, Madam Chair. Sure. It, it may already be in someone's motion. Uh, but we talked about shooting the foundation before the house gets dropped on top of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be part of the decision. I agree, that's a good point. Okay. Okay. Um, so if, if there's, we don't have, there was no public comment. Um, if we, if, if we don't have, if there's no other comments from board members, um, would someone care to make a motion on this one? Uh, I'll make the motion that we approve the application as requested with the aforementioned conditions that were discussed. Okay. And would someone care to second? Second. 
Okay, so Michael's made the motion and Jeff has seconded. Okay, I will go through a uh, roll call vote. So uh, Susan McCarthy, aye. Michael O'Mara. Aye. Karen Kosayatek. Aye. Jeff Thayer. Aye. And Jim Mondani. Aye. Okay. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. your time today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, I think that is it for today. We don't have any other business. Do we? We don't need to. Um, Eleanor, I don't. We don't need to vote on continuing, right? It's the. No, vote. no, no. I mean, I noticed it as continued, so I just wanted to keep it on there. You know. Yep. On our, on our radar. Okay. Um, great. So that is it for today. Unless someone, anyone has anything else, we can um, vote to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Okay. Karen made the motion. Do, um, someone want a second? Sure. Okay. So I will do roll call again. Myself, I, Michael O'Mara. Aye. Karim Kosayatak. Aye. Jeff Thayer. Aye. And Mark Poor. Aye. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll see you in a month or sooner, maybe. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye now.